All right, thank you, Jeremy. I am Ryan Van Ruckel, and I'm a PhD graduate student at the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville. I'm studying under Dr. Larry Purcell and uh, looking at everything maximum yield. So today I'd like to start this talk by thanking the Arkansas Soybean Promotion Board for funding this research and allowing me to come down here and pursue a PhD. I need to thank our grower cooperators uh, for, allowing me on <coughs> for allowing me on their farms to do this research. Um, special thanks to Randy C. It was a lot of help out in Newport. And I gotta thank Pioneer Hybrids for funding a portion of the strip trial research I'm gonna talk about here in a minute as well as uh, Pioneer, Monsanto, and Syngenta for providing seed for all this work. The outline for my talk today, I'm gonna to start with a brief background on current yield levels and the yield records. And then I'm gonna talk about three aspects of my dissertation research. First being a variety trial in a maximum yield environment in Fayetteville. And then we looked at some of the individual treatments that Mr. Kohlers is doing and uh, looked at those in Fayetteville and our large on-farm strip trials um, to finish off. So I'd like to start by talking about the Arkansas soybean yield averages from 1980 to 2011. Uh, the blue line on top there is the irrigated soybean yields, and the red line on the bottom is the non-irrigated. And so a couple things you notice from that slide is the irrigated yields are much more consistent, and they're in increasing at a faster rate there, about four-tenths of a bushel per acre per year. Um, over time, uh, yields have increased from about 25. In, a, in the last five years, we're averaging about 40 bushel per acre yields. This is statewide average. Some growers, um, quite a few growers, have been able to double that average and get up to 80 bushels per acre. But only one person has quadrupled that average, and that's Mr. Kip Kohlers. Uh, he has reported uh, 161 bushels per acre in 2010 for the Missouri Soybean Association Yield Contest. They have an annual yield contest, much like the Arkansas Soybean Promotion Board, and he first entered that contest in 2006. Um, he's really in a category of his own. Second place has been right around 100 bushels per acre. Um, because of this, he's drawn a lot of attention. Uh, these yields are higher than anybody's ever seen or even thought possible. And because of that, Dr. Purcell got in contact with Mr. Kohler's, and, and Dr. Purcell has actually been on Mr. Kohler's farm taking measurements of his soybean since 2008. Um, they worked out an agreement and I came on board in 2011 and really intensified our efforts uh, on his farm, taking measurements, and then we wanted to establish some research in Fayetteville to back up those measurements to see if we get the same results. And so I'm going to talk about that a little bit today. The first portion of that is the variety trial. And so essentially, um, it's, a, it's you know, a normal variety trial. The difference is this is in a maximum yield environment. And we're taking a lot of the physiological measurements on how fast these crops are growing, the nutritional status, and those sorts of things. And so we had 12 or 14 varieties. And uh, these are top varieties from Monsanto, Syngenta, and Pioneer. And they range in relative maturity from a 4.2 up to a 5.5. And these are all indeterminate soybeans. Uh, the, these are small plots in that they're 30 feet long, four rows wide. Uh, we harvest the center out of them and uh, replicate it four times. So when we talk about maximum yield management, and uh, this is what we're talking about. And the first thing we do is we come into these research fields in Fayetteville, just standard measurements. And so we come in a soil test and amend, a, amend our soil test. Um, for instance, the one field tested low on potassium. And potassium is a, a very important nutrient for soybeans. Uh, over a year, a soybean plant can uptake about four pounds of potassium per bushel of soybeans. And we're talking about a yield goal of 160 bushels per acre. That's 600 pounds of K per acre. And so we're amending with, with standard fertilizer, and then we're coming in with poultry litter, much like Mr. Kohler's doing, eight to 10 tons of poultry litter. Uh, we split that in a half, um, a heavy half in the fall, followed up in the spring, immediately incorporated that. Um, after we got the fall poultry litter incorporated, we came in and did some deep tillage, some vertical tillage, try to eliminate any kind of a root restriction, uh, any of those hard pan layers, just so we get good water infiltration, not limit our root system in any way. Early planting is the next thing we try to do. 2011 was a little challenge. We got planted in early May, which I'm going to call late planting. Early planting is early April or earlier, uh, and we'll talk about that with some of the strip trials. We planted one field in March, in fact. In Fayetteville, 2012, we planted April 11th, same day as Mr. Kohler's, 
and we're using narrow rows. In Fayetteville, we're using 18 inch rows. Mr. Kohler's is on a 30 inch twin row, eight inches apart, so essentially a 22 inch gap in the middle. And a modest plant density, only 140,000 plants per acre, and we're using a sprinkler irrigation system. This is a over the top, much like center pivot irrigation system. We're using a, an irrigation model, irrigating at a one inch deficit. And so during the heat of the summer, that means we're irrigating about every other day, every third day. Um, and this summer especially, uh, we put on almost 26 inches of water on these soybeans. Then during reproductive growth, we have, we have a fertigation system. And so we're putting out 32% UAN, potassium nitrate, and ammonium sulfate uh, through the irrigation water to supplement our poultry litter and fertility program. And we're doing this just during reproductive, about um, R3 on, uh, focusing majority of the nitrogen from R5 on during seed fill when uh, the soybean has a huge demand for that nitrogen to fill those high-protein high seeds. Uh, preventative fungicides were important with this overhead irrigation system, a lot of moisture on the leaves, and strict pest management. And uh, by pest management, I'm talking about all of it, uh, diseases, weeds, insects, um, this field was kept very clean. We had a pre-emergence herbicide, uh, opposed to glyphosate and hand weeding on top of that. With these narrow inch rows and the high fertility, soybeans canopied very fast. We didn't have very, uh, weed, weed pressure was very low. Um, and insects were scouted for and sprayed. Uh, there was a total of about six insecticide applications made to this field, kept very clean. Uh, we're still scouting and spraying, just lowering our thresholds and uh, mirroring basically what Mr. Kohler's is doing. So, as you can imagine, this kept me very busy all summer, but I'm happy with the results. The best soybean there you see averaged 115 bushels per acre. I had over half of my varieties average over 100 bushels per acre, the worst one being 86 bushels. That's not too shabby considering the year. Now there's no clear, um, no clear pattern on relative maturity. You see this top variety is a Pioneer 94Y23. Second one was an Asgrow 53.5332. That's a 5.3 in a terminate, and we had some Syngenta beans up there as well. And there's a wide difference. This is a 29 bushel per acre difference on these varieties. And so this is one thing I want to hammer home: is variety selection. Uh, you'll see this in the Arkansas soybean variety testing as well. When you look at one location, it's not uncommon to see a 30 bushel difference between the varieties. And picking the right one will make a huge difference. Um, and this not only applies to maximum yield, this applies to all your soybean acres, choosing the right variety. And so I mentioned a lot of uh, our work is physiological measurements, and I'm not going to give you many, very many numbers on that, but I want to talk about it a little bit. And the first thing I want to talk about, this is the growth season we had in 2012. These are the high, daily high temperatures um, from over our growing season. And the red line there is at 98 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's where we really start running into trouble where soybeans really start shedding their pods and you can start to lose yield. And you see in the shaded areas, these soybeans, um, these soybeans over here, these soybeans, these soybeans uh, started into R5 here um, at the end of June and July. And you see a wide range, that's from the rel relative maturity range. R1 here occurred in the end of May and uh, in early June, and that led to R3 being around the summer solstice. And so when I talk about narrow rows and early planting, the biggest thing I want to talk about is getting a full canopy and start setting pods around that summer solstice. When a soybean plant is, uh, and the flowers are trying to decide whether to turn into pods, they're taking, taking an inventory on what they have. Can I support these pods? How many pods can I support? And if you've got a full canopy and it's making those decisions around the summer solstice, that's how you can set the most number of pods, and that's a great way to increase your yield. The number of pods is the most important thing, and that's what we're seeing up at Mr. Kohler's, is, is really, it's just an immense number of pods. Uh, that's really the only difference. His soybean plants are just as tall as many that I've seen in Arkansas, the same number of nodes. He's just getting more pods around every node, and that's where you're increasing your yield, and that's where I would tell you early planting in narrow rows. Now the next thing I want to talk about physiology is uh, these soybeans here is what they look like in Fayetteville uh, this year. These soybeans inside these pods, these brown pods, the seeds are at 13% moisture. 
These are at R8. They're ready to harvest. But I've got a crazy amount of green leaves and green stems on here. What we call this is sink limited. What happened was there's not enough seeds there to break down all the protein and all the leaf tissue to put into the seeds. Now you've seen this before probably in some dry land fields. You get a really hot summer. They don't set very many pods and you get some favorable rains, favorable weather, and the leaves will stick. Same thing, there wasn't enough seeds there, not enough pods to break down all the leaf tissue to put in those seeds. Difference is, these are sink limited at 115 bushels per acre. And so this is where we looked at Mr. Kohler, some of the things, and, and this is the same thing we see at his farm every year. The fertility program, the nitrogen accumulation rate of these soybeans is the highest we've ever measured. Uh, possibly the highest anybody's ever measured. Uh, radiation use efficiency is very, very high. And all of it comes back to that high yield management I just talked about. All those things working together to, uh, to create this growing environment. Um, so the first step in, in this high yield management is crop protection. Uh, you're going to hear a lot about irrigation management, pest control, weed management. All those things need to be done perfectly. You can't be losing yield to any, any kind of a pest. Any kind of a weed is going gonna, is gonna to compete for your sunlight, compete for water, nutrients, all that. Um, so that's the first step. Second step is timely irrigation. You can't be losing yield to water stress. And, uh, and if you're serious about high yields, you need to make sure you're not losing yield to water stress. Um, I'm talking about I, I, with that overhead irrigation system, watering every other day. Um, and that, that was really uh, about right. Mr. Kohler's the water every day sometimes. Adequate fertility is important. Keep an eye on these high yields. Re recall when your soil tests come back, the recommendations are for a 50 bushel crop. And when you're looking at 80 bushel soybeans, you might need to adjust that up. And early planting in the old rows, I think I hammered that home. And all these things work together to maximize your yield. I can't really recommend one of these things. If you're going to do one, you really need to do them all. And they'll all work together that way. And to, uh, to go along with that all together, I want to talk about uh, the next section of my research, the uh, individual treatment trial. And so this is where we looked at some of the individual things. And Mr. Kohler's does everything we described earlier and quite a few other things. And some of the things are his seed treatment program is a little unconventional. Um, he's got a 3x rate of optimized 400, which is just a standard soybean inoculant. And then he's got BioForge, which is an antioxidant stress-reducing compound. He puts that as a seed treatment. And Accolade is a peat-based inoculant of free-living uh, nitrogen-fixing bacteria. And then um, in, in our study, we have an untreated check. And, it, and untreated is in quotes because it does have insecticide and uh, fungicide with that. And so that's one of our programs. We looked at all combinations of these and all together. Uh, the next is a herbicide burn. And this had nothing to do with weed control, but he came in at a, at a young soybean at about V3, and he purposely burns it with cobra and, uh, and burns the leaves really good. And so we had to try that. He did that in 2010, and they got some good pictures of it. I mean, he dang near killed those soybeans. And then he came back and made 160 bushels per acre. So that was something we had to look at. Um, to go along with that, uh, in 2012, we added AIM and CADET. Um, as some different options to get some burn, and uh, I'll discuss the yield results on that. Uh, one thing the promotion board and others that wanted us to look at is, uh, is what does the impact of like a picket row fence spacing, a plant spacing, have on yield? Um, that's something we hear about in corn, uh, especially in the Midwest. They, they like to talk about that, even out the competition um, and increase your yield that way. So we wanted to look at that and also even emergence, getting all those soybeans out of the ground at the same time. And then uh, we looked at an ethylene inhibitor. And this is something that uh, ethylene is, a, is a, one of the plant hormones that's involved in pod abortion, pod and seed abortion. And so the idea was if we can inhibit that, we can stick a few more pods and increase our yield that way. And so that was one of the things we looked at. And uh, we strung one up like tomatoes to, to prevent lodging too, because that's been a problem before with all this fertility. Um, and so here, I'm going to talk about the seed treatments first. All these graphs are going to be the same yield on the y-axis here and our treatments on the bottom. In 2011, our seed treatments, uh, 2011, our yields were down a little bit. You see I was in the 80 bushel range. Uh, BioForge ended up being our best. And uh, untreated and optimized and accolade were all right in there, statistically similar. 
Um, and recall, untreated is fungicide and insecticide seed treatments. In 2012, we got some better yields and a little bit of a rank change. Optimizing ended up being our best one. Bioforge and untreated again right in there. And so the take-home message here is really there's no advantage over insecticide, fungicide. Uh, recall, this is all in the maximum yield environment I discussed earlier. Um, nodulation is not a problem. Soybeans have been in the rotation before. And the important thing with our early planting, just get that insecticide, fungicide out there. Uh, the next thing is these herbicide burns. You see here is our cobra and crop oil. This is 2% uh, crop oil with a full rate of cobra. And these really burn the soybeans. And we got a yield response. And uh, that was really surprising. Looking at these soybeans, we didn't see anything different. The idea Mr. Kohler's had behind this was his soybeans in the past had gotten really tall and fallen over and lodged bad. And so he wanted just to burn, burn the crap out of them and keep them short and make them branch. So we burned them, and I didn't see any of that. They looked like the same height. They didn't branch. They didn't look any better, but we got a yield response. So in 2012, we looked at it again. That yield response disappeared. We didn't see that. Um, AIM and Cadet AIM will really burn some soybeans if you want to do that. Uh, and Cadet was recommended to me from a, a friend of mine in Illinois. It's kind of a slow burn. Um, and, and all these would, would bronze the leaves, and then they would grow out of it in, uh, in about a week, week and a half. And again, I'm not seeing any kind of a plant response. I'm not seeing a reduction in height. We're not seeing increased branching. Um, but there is no worse, potentially no better. Um, one of the growers we're working on, with on our strip trial also did a strip trial with Cobra. He saw no response this year. Um, at this time, we don't understand why this would increase yield, um, and we're going to look at it again next year. But uh, for now, just uh, stick with a good, clean weed control uh, program. No yield increase, but no worries. Um, that even in a row spacing I was telling you about, we don't have access to a brand new, perfect uh, planter, so we planted early and I thinned these out at emergence. No response there. Um, and the theory behind that is, well, soybeans are a little bit different than corn. If there's a little bit of a gap, soybean will really branch out and fill in that gap. Um, and so this is not something that's critical with soybeans, um, is, a, is a, an even row spacing. Um, the ethylene inhibitor, again, sounded great on paper. It didn't work in practice. Um, the idea is that that compound is very volatile and it doesn't last very long, and a soybean has uh, an ability to abort pods all the way up until nearly the end, and uh, that makes it frustrating to work with uh, when you're trying to set more pods when it'll just go ahead and shed them later, but uh, we'll keep looking. And no response prevented lodging. There was no lodging uh, in either year. Conclusion here, no yield increase over previously described management, and so again, this goes back to when people see what Mr. Kohler's is doing with that Cobra and things like that, Oh, that's got to be it. That's how he's doing 160 bushels per acre. And I'm saying, no, I think it's all that management I previously described and all of it working together, um, paying attention to the details and, and doing just everything that we know right. And so with that, I want to talk about our large-scale strip trials. And this is a really fun aspect of our research, getting to come downstate, East Arkansas, work with some big new equipment, having a lot of fun with, uh, with our growers. And so in 2012, we had two growers. Um, Mr. Dow Brantley and Michael Taylor in England and Helena. And in 2012, we added the Hegwoods up in Newport. And we've got five varieties. These are pioneer indeterminate soybean varieties from a 4.4 to a 5.1. And these are one-acre strips and replicated five or six times. So we're looking at a 25 or 30-acre field um, that we're doing these strip trials in. And what we wanted to do was, uh, like I said, validate those practices. And so we wanted to not duplicate what Mr. Kohler's is doing, but take away some of the more practical, more of the, the points um, that we think we could help yields. So and the first being just uh, keeping an eye on soil fertility. And so we soil sample these fields, make sure they've got good fertility, and then we supplemented with some poultry litter. Not 10 tons, but just two tons the acre, just to give them a little boost there. And then early planting. Early planting is one of the biggest things we're looking at, one of the biggest things we're going to push. And one of the, I mean, it doesn't cost you anything more just to plant a couple days early. Um, in 2011, things were a little bit tougher. We got planted on April 8th, April 18th in Helena. In uh, 2012, you call the spring was just perfect weather, uh, warm and dry. In England, we got planted again about the 5th 
Illinois the 10th, and Newport was planted March 29th. And those soybeans emerged in about three days. Uh, it was really something. Um, but again, that all comes back to getting a full canopy, getting them flowering and setting pods around the longest days of the year. Um, set more pods, increase your yield that way. Frequent irrigation, just keeping an eye on that. Um, but most of these fields were furrow irrigated. We had one field uh, with under a center pivot, and we'll talk about that a little bit more, and intensive pest management. And so weed control programs were uh, pre-emerge and post-emerge with residuals, and weeds were very clean. Uh, they got two fungicide applications, first one being at R3, and then again two weeks after that. And insects were scouted for and sprayed um, as best as, as, uh, as often as we needed. Again, looking at thresholds, dropping down a little bit more than that. More often than not, if you're scouting for, soil, for insects and you're seeing them, you're spraying. So at all these locations, management varied a little bit. And so here was Helena. Um, you see this is a 30-inch row planter. Uh, we've got starter fertilizer in the tanks. And uh, this had a rye cover crop and planted this April 11th. And they looked really good mid-year, uh, nice full canopy. And then in England, we planted our twin rows on beds. And the problem was we got some massive rainstorms shortly after that, and we washed out um, almost one of those twin rows, clear off the bed. And uh, this was uh, really heartbreaking. I mean, we almost, almost uh, gave up on this field altogether. Well, and, you know, by the end of the year, we kept it. It was looking pretty good. You see this one row is still a little bit stunted. And we didn't quite, you know, you can kind of see the, the gap in the rows there. Um, but, again, we, hang, we, we held on to it. And at the end of the year, this is England, at the end of the year, we got around 70 bushels per acre. And, uh, and I mean, I'm talking about I had to talk Mr. Brantler out of, out of tilling that field under and, uh, and keep that in production. And we came back with about 70 bushels per acre. Um, and so that was really impressive to me. Again, these soybeans have the ability to fill in at flex. This field ended up with a final stand, about 80,000 plants per acre, and they just kind of bushed and filled in and uh, ended up with some pretty good yields that way. The later varieties ended up being a little bit better in this field, the uh, 4.8 and the 5.1. Um, this field was planted a little bit earlier, and, uh, and they had maybe a little bit more time to recover from that early rainstorm. In Helena, uh, the earlier varieties were better. We were around 80 bushels per acre average. Um, 83, this is over about five or six acres uh, average, and uh, very happy with these yields um, in Helena and England in 2011. And so what we wanted to do was, again, you know, just kind of validate early planting. This is something a lot of good growers will, will be, uh, well, yeah, 80 bushels is kind of what we expect, and we wanted to document that. So the next step was, well, let's try to push for 100 bushels per acre then. The Arkansas Soybean Promotion Board has that 100 bushel challenge. Let's really try to push for that. And so one of the things we thought was keeping us from getting to 100 bushels per acre was nitrogen. And so we wanted to work with some supplemental nitrogen. In Newport, England, we flew on urea and irrigated that in. These are furrow irrigated fields. In Helena, it was a center pivot. And so we set it up with fertigation and we put on the nitrogen through the water and irrigated about every three days. And so what we saw, uh, again, this is the England Twin Rose, and this is the long stay of the year here. This is what I'm talking about, where I want a full canopy, and these soybeans are into R3, set in pods, uh, long, beautiful days, setting a high number of pods here. And at the end of the year, we still had quite a few green leaves. So again, this is the same idea, these were sink limited. That extra little bit of nitrogen in combination with the heat and some of those things, we didn't quite have enough pods there to completely break down these plants and self-destruct, and we had to uh, defoliate these, this field. In Newport, here's April 16th. Recall we planted this on March 29th. In Newport, um, our options, with these are on 38-inch beds, and uh, we, our option was a 38-inch single row planter or a 20-foot drill. And so we went with the drill to go with the narrower rows Got three rows on the bed here, and uh, by the longest day of the year, you can't see a single row, you can't see a bed, it's just solid soybean cover. And uh, that's really what we like to see. Um, set a high number of pods that way. The pod counts were great in the 40, 50 bushel pod counts, um, and that's what we're looking for. At the end of the year, these had to be defoliated. This is what they look like after paraquat and sodium chlorate and crop oil. Knock all the leaves off of there 
and uh, give them time, and the stems lose a little bit of their color. Great yields in, in Newport. In Helena, we're on 30-inch 30, 30 rows again. This is under a pivot this time. Uh, things were looking great. We, uh, with that supplemental nitrogen, we were able to hang on to a lot of these pods. The problem was, at the end of the year, um, they died. They lost all their yield, their, their leaves. These were not defoliated. And we dug into this a little bit deeper. It turns out we had a charcoal rot, something fierce. This whole field had charcoal rot, terrible. And we believe that probably set in early before we started some intensive management, uh, before we really ran that pivot every three days. Um, and that was really kind of a heartbreaker. Our seed weights were, were down. And I believe this field had the potential for 100 bushels per acre. Uh, yields here in Newport. Newport was our best location. We had a variety, average 95 bushels per acre. Uh, Randy C. and I were really hoping to see 100. Uh, we had one strip do 99 and uh, average 95. So great year considering uh, the heat and the, the challenge with keeping up with irrigation. Uh, whole field averaged about 90 bushels to the acre. Not a real clear trend on, on uh, relative maturity. When we're planting really early like that, we tend to lean towards the later varieties. Um, and in Newport, that worked out. In England, um, a little bit all over the board. The earliest variety was, ended up being our best, average 89 bushels the acre. And uh, the 4.7 and the 5.1, also very good. Um, and that field had some stink bug issues um, that uh, we had a little bit of a slip there. Um, but overall, really felt uh, we did a great job. And in Helena, again, uh, good yields, 89 to 84. But uh, seed weight was about 3,300 seeds per pound, and these other two locations were closer to 2,700 seeds per pound. And uh, the other two locations, again, had the leaves on them. We had to defoliate them. We think that's what uh, really contributed to it, and this, and this charcoal rot killed us early. And so that just goes to show how important managing all your diseases are. If you let one of them slip, uh, they'll hammer you. And in this case, it was about six bushels worth. Uh, wrap this up. With uh, conclusions a little bit, early planting narrow rows, I talked about that a bunch, irrigation, fertility, pest control, um, don't forget the basics, doing everything right. Uh, nitrogen fixation, the most profitable, I'll mention on that a little bit. We have some rough economics on this. In Helena, we spent $190 per acre extra with that nitrogen and second fungicide, and we got an eight bushel response. Um, the other side of the pivot did not get the extra water and nitrogen and uh, was eight bushels lower. That does not work out, even with these high dollar soybeans. Um, so again, in the name of science and, and, that, and that trivial number of 100 bushels per acre, uh, chasing that um, is, uh, is not profitable. And, uh, and Dr. Purcell is really an expert on nitrogen fixation. And in a lot of his work in Fayetteville, uh, he's, he's measured all that. And at 70 bushels per acre, you're not limited by nitrogen, which means at 80 bushels an acre, you're probably not. At 90, you might be. At 100, you might be limited by nitrogen. The hard part with this is every time you apply a little bit of nitrogen, they just don't fix a little bit. And so this is something we're chasing. We're still going to be working with this a little bit. At this point, we're not going to recommend any supplemental nitrogen. Um, stick to the basics, early planting. Watch your fertility. Watch potassium especially, um, things like that, and timely water. And I'll say it again. These only respond to the whole package. Uh, you really got to be doing all these things if you want to elevate your yields to these levels. Thank you.